Here I'm going to talk about problem identification and definition. So you have taken all these observations, which are just notes about one-time events that you witness personally. Problem identification is when you take these observations and try to see if those situations describe a frequently experienced difficulty in giving patients care. This is when you determine if the one-time event is really part of a pattern that the care providers experience in treating patients. The problem that is defined using the observations will be used to define a need statement, and this need statement will be used to define the scope of the project later on. To clarify, an observation statement is a description of a singular event that the innovator witnesses during a clinical observation. A problem statement describes a recurring situation in which doubt, uncertainty, or difficulty is met in the process of providing clinical care. You want to investigate why a problem occurs. What are some of the explanations and causes? You are going to be observing several stakeholders, and the problems you identify may affect one or more of these stakeholders. In this stage, you need to make sure that the problems you identify negatively impact one or more stakeholders in the healthcare system, and that you can gauge the severity of the impact on those affected. The observation stage should take you through several different settings in the space you are focused in, and the problems that emerge can be related to any of those related settings. You want to pick a problem that can be verified with both observational experiences and offline research to determine if the potential problem is worth addressing. I won't discuss interviewing strategies now. When you do interviews with stakeholders, you will see that they give you a lot of project ideas. You are just going to be sitting there asking open-ended questions, and they will respond with descriptions of an exact device they have in mind, or a particular problem they run into personally. You should write these interview responses down, but remember, this project is for your team, and it is the goal of your team to come up with what you think is the relevant problem and address it with your own solution. So you shouldn't allow a stakeholder to hand off a problem to you because they think it is worth pursuing. You should take that as one of the inputs to the problem, and you have to verify that as a team, and then back it up on your own to justify defining that problem. The interviews just reveal one person's experiences or opinions about something. One surgeon might describe a problem about performing one procedure, and you might see at another hospital that a different surgeon does not encounter the same problem at all. The more inputs you have to work with at this time, the more likely you are to choose a real problem. Don't just use one data point as justification. In the problem identification phase, don't think of solutions yet. If you see something wrong with a device or the way you see someone being treated, you can write it down, but don't put any emphasis on it at this point. The whole goal is identification. Identify the source of the observed difficulties. The solution phase will happen later. Right now we are just building up a collection of inputs to verify that the observation is tied to a more general negative pattern that is worth addressing as an engineer. You will spend a few weeks on the problem identification phase, and you will have to be patient and not worry about solutions at this time. This is an example about an observation of a perfusion pump situation. A perfusion pump is used when a patient's heart is placed on bypass during a heart operation. The pump artificially oxygenates and circulates the patient's blood acting as the patient's lungs and heart. In this example, a nurse accidentally left a clamp on one of the pump lines and forgot that it was there. This caused a large pressure buildup in one of the tubes, and the tube lost its connection to the machine. The surgeons had to react quickly to get the patient back on the perfusion pump system. If you are a student observing this in the operating room, hopefully that wakes you up and you are paying attention. If something goes terribly wrong, you should step out of the room. But if, if it is something that happens so quickly like this, you are likely going to be there to witness the whole thing. Record an observation in your notebook like this. In the middle of the procedure, the perfusion pump stopped working and the surgeons momentarily didn't know why this was going on. That's just an observation. You observed that the pump stopped working. That was a fact that occurred. There's no argument whether that happened. The next thing where there is more argument is the problem behind that. Why did that observation take place? That's the part you don't know the answers to on the spot. You just had that observation. The next thing you will do is take that observation out of the clinic and build up that verification of why that observation occurred, and that is what the problem is. Let's try to break down the problem of this perfusion pump example. If you go down this pyramid in the clinical space, the clamp was misapplied by the nurse. That happened in the clinical space at the level of an individual directly responsible. But what happens at the next level down? Were there any local workplace factors in the room that could have caused the clamp to be forgotten on the pump line? 
whilst the perfusion is performing a distracting or fatiguing f task that prevented an earlier discovery of the forgotten clamp? Was there a lack of communication or organization inside the operating room? Are there not enough safety checks and pauses during the procedure before moving on? Go down another level to the organization level. Did the incident occur because resources were stressed at the hospital? Did the incident happen because of the equipment available or the unavailability of equipment? Was the wrong clamp ordered or was there a missing label? All of these things could contribute to the cause of the incident. It is up to you to work through a pyramid like this to identify the true cause of the problem. What happened in this example was that a nurse made a careless error in the clinical space. You shouldn't interpret the observation at first glance as the result of the problem that nurses don't have a reminder system in case they forget a task. You should investigate the entire context of the observation to identify the most significant cause of the observation. It is also possible that the same experience could be observed at another hospital and that the cause of the problem occurs at a different level. You are likely on track to discovering a good problem if it occurs at multiple hospitals and the causes are similar at each of the hospitals. Most people think that a patient's treatment outcome is related to only two factors, being the patient's condition and the surgeon's skill. The severity of a patient's condition plus the surgeon's ability to treat that condition sum up to equal the total expected treatment outcome for the patient. But really, these aren't the only two input factors that determine a treatment success. Really, there is another unknown variable in this equation. As biomedical engineers, you are trying to solve for that unknown variable to get the best results at the end of this equation. The unknown context factor can be related to a lot of things. Things like trust amongst the people providing the care, how good is the communication, how good is the leadership. These are all social factors that have an effect on the treatment success. What about things that are not social but based on physical factors, like the environment, distractions, people's energy, resources available, information known at the time. Most importantly, as biomedical engineers, you should be really pumped up about that last term, technology, because that is the space we are trying to work within. This is also the factor that is probably subject to the most evolution over time. These variables are not mutually exclusive either. You can develop a technology that trains surgeons, and this would increase the surgeon's skill. One goal of device design is to create technology that has consistent outputs regardless of the user's skill and thus always contributes positively to this equation. Going back to this pyramid, there are individual factors that can cause a problem and systematic factors that can cause a problem. At every single level of the pyramid, the problem could be caused by the interaction with technology. The lack of technology or the use of inadequate technology already possessed can be the cause of the problem. It is your goal to figure out the interaction of these different levels with technology. During observations, you are going to write down all of the questions you have. You should look them up, and if you can't get clear answers, you should ask the questions in stakeholder interviews. Use literature from academic journals to answer questions, and use visual resources online if you can find them. Once you have inputs in the form of observations and interview responses, you are at the stage of forming a hypothesis about a potential identified problem. The key to turning this hypothesized problem into a defined problem is to use additional literature reviews and stakeholder interviews to further validate the significance and causes of the problem. What you want to do is verify the level of the problems in the pyramid. and You want to make sure that the pyramid is sitting within a city of identical pyramids experiencing the same problem. You will have to backtrack a few steps and do several rounds of research before you can confirm that you have identified a real problem. After this, you will move on to the articulation of a need statement. The best databases that you have access to as students are PubMed and the Web of Science. PubMed is the best one covering the largest range of topics. If you have been doing research in a lab already, your professor probably asked you on the first day to read some papers, and that is really good experience. I really want you to be able to find relevant papers and use them effectively to justify your decisions. The most effective way to gain credibility from engineers, scientists, and physicians listening to your presentations and reading your reports is to demonstrate effective use of published literature. Your points are most effective when you cite information from academic journals found on these databases. It looks good when you bring up information found in the literature during your interviews with stakeholders. Look for key papers and ask your stakeholders to comment on some of the key findings. The second best database is Web of Science. Also, check out the North Carolina Biotechnology Center. They have access to a lot of articles and databases. 
I don't recommend doing a general library search because you will get a lot of results from popular literature like magazines, which are not as convincing. It is not unusual for teams to come back from the observation and problem phase with a list of 200 problems. This is the easy part. The hard part is filtering out the good ones and developing a need statement for similar problems. Here are some examples from a team I worked with in the cardiothoracic space. I like the way that the observations and problems are visualized in these examples, and I think they will help you understand the relationship between observations and problems. The observation here was that someone saw in the ICU, which is the intensive care unit where people go to recover immediately after a surgery, that wires and IV lines were getting tangled during patient transport. The team member found a journal paper discussing this issue and its causes. The frequency of the problem was also indicated in the paper. The observation was not just occurring at that first hospital, but was occurring all over as indicated by the paper. For this reason, this observation was easily translated to an identified problem. I'm not going to talk about the need statement at this point. In this second example, we saw that most of the patients having heart operations were obese, and that the surgeons were having difficulty performing minimally invasive procedures on them because of the excess tissue. This was an observation we noted over several weeks. The problem was that the surgeons are not able to provide the same type of treatment to obese patients, even though they would benefit. This was cited in several papers and made it clear that this was a real problem that surgeons around the country experience.